Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker and in this video we will be continuing my series on hate speech, specifically my answer to Jehovah's Witnesses, my former religion, accusing me of hate speech in a failed attempt to get me thrown out of ICSA, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse for England and Wales as a core participant. If you're coming into part three without having watched parts one and two, all of this might seem very confusing. Rather than repeating myself, I'll just ask you to stop watching this video, go back and watch the first two, and everything should hopefully become clear. But we're up to part three. We are now taking a look at the nine-page dossier that Jehovah's Witnesses sent ICSA with quote-unquote examples of me, Lloyd Evans, inciting religious hatred against Jehovah's Witnesses. Part one, oh, on YouTube and Twitter. <laughs> part one is statements downplaying the Holocaust and other acts of persecution, vehement and sweeping statements against a religious group. So in this video, we're going to be dealing with just this first part of the dossier, which effectively accuses me of Holocaust denial. I'm sure I'm not the only one who comes away with that meaning from the wording they have very deliberately chosen there. Anyway, this first section is three pages long. So in doing this part, part three of the video, we're already going to be a third of the way through the nine-page dossier. And I will be making the relevant pages available as a download link in the description below in case you want to go over it in more detail. But let's get stuck right into this. There are going to be eight examples of me inciting religious hatred in this first part of the dossier. The first is based on a video that I uploaded in 2017. Let's read Psalm 54, 6, uh, the entire verse. Psalm 54, 6. It starts out, as we, as we have already considered, I will sacrifice to you willingly, but then it says, I will praise your name, O Jehovah, for it is good. More directly said, really, it's Jehovah is good. His name is good, but he is good. And everything he requires of us is good. There's no command from God for his servants that is bad. It's always for our benefit. Even the elimination of the wicked really is good because it shows love for those who just want to live in peace and worship their great God in joy and happiness. So that's also something that's very good what he's going to do. So why wouldn't we want to offer sacrifices to our great God willingly? Point number two, shunning. If you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's organization comes first and family comes second. That means that if one of your family members makes a conscientious decision to stop being one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they are to be shunned. You must break off all contact with them. They might have really good reasons. They might be really genuine in their reasons. They may have found some real injustice that can't be explained some scandal or some double standard or something that proves categorically that their beliefs don't uh, hold up to scrutiny and you're still expected to cast them out of your family. And this is again where lots of Jehovah's Witnesses would say, oh, well, that's God's command. Um, as William Mellenfant was saying, God is good. So if God commands something, incidentally, uh, God is good is another way of saying God is great and God is great is Allah Akbar I think is what is what 
uh, Muslims say, including, and, and I know not all Muslims are terrorists, but that's what terrorists scream just as they're about to plough a vehicle into a crowd or just as they're about to uh, blow themselves up. You know, just because someone says God is good doesn't mean that the thing that they are excusing with that argument is necessarily good. Anybody can make that claim about more or less anything. What you need to do is look at the specifics. And when it comes to shunning, when it comes to families being literally broken apart because somebody has stopped being one of Jehovah's Witnesses for whatever reason, there is never an excuse for it. So I don't have too much to say on this. I don't think I've said anything there that's too outrageous or extraordinary. I can understand why they've chosen it, because there I am talking about uh, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism and use of the phrase Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. So taken in isolation, maybe it sounds odd or maybe it sounds shocking. But what they've done, as you've quite clearly seen there, is they've taken the part that could sound shocking, bereft of context, and they've taken the context off at the end there where I explain that just because people say God is good doesn't mean the behaviours, the policies, the teachings they're trying to justify are necessarily good. Again, it's fairly straightforward logic, reasoning, common sense. It's making what I hope is a very clear and coherent argument that saying God is good is not in itself a justification for doing things. So anyway, that was the first example of a statement from me downplaying the Holocaust and other acts of persecution. I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing me downplaying the Holocaust or inciting hatred against Jehovah's Witnesses in those comments. I should just add that this video will contain eight supposed examples of me doing this, of me indulging in hate speech. There are other videos cited in the dossier. Actually, there's one other video cited in the dossier, which is uh, taking on Tony Five <laughs> from... March 5th, 2019, but they just have a time marker in there of seven minutes. They've not bothered to actually write down exactly what it is that I said that's so appalling. Basically, I'm skipping that entirely. If they can't be bothered to actually write down what it, what it is I've said that's hateful, I'm ignoring it in this series. So we press on to the second example of hate speech. I wish I had a video to show you, but I don't, because the second example is taken, well, it's taken from a live stream reviewing the Shepherd book part two of three with Mark O'Donnell. This was a series of live streams in which I basically went through the Shepherd book with a fine tooth comb, highlighting all of the obvious examples of um, contradictions and um, injustice and questionable policies when it comes to abuse and that sort of thing. We did this series of live streams and they've zeroed in on part two of that series. But the reason why I can't really show you the example is because, I'm not kidding, the example that they have cited is not me talking. It's not even Mark talking, who was my guest on the live stream. I kid you not, <laughs> they have cited some random person who apparently commented in the live chat during the live stream and included that statement in a document headed statements by Lloyd Evans inciting religious hatred against Jehovah's Witnesses. And 
the comment reads, and it's a comment that I completely condemn and disavow and wish to point out, these are not my words. I wouldn't dream of saying any such thing. Uh, but apparently, someone commented on the live chat, I sometimes wonder if Hitler had the right idea <clears throat> and Jehovah's Witnesses should have been gassed. Those poor kids would not have been put through this as a result. And you'll see there, it says, comment on Lloyd Evans's YouTube channel by user places to visit in North Yorkshire. I have actually checked the live chat and I think what's happened is that YouTube has removed the comment uh, after CCJW compiled this document. Maybe even CCJW complained to YouTube and that resulted in the comment being removed. I have no idea. The point is <laughs> the point is the comment is no longer there and more importantly it wasn't my comment. So why is it being included? And bear in mind, they've gone to the trouble of not just including this on a document, again headed, Statements by Lloyd Evans. And by the way, in the heading, it says Statements downplaying the Holocaust. And then there's a footnote there, footnote one. Unless otherwise indicated... All statements cited herein were made by Lloyd Evans. So they could argue, oh, well, we've indicated. We've at least indicated that Lloyd didn't make the statement. But if you're Ixa and you're just breezing through it, you're going to get upset by the comment and you're not necessarily going to pick up on the fact that it wasn't me who said it, unless you're being very careful. So, anyway, in this comment, which again, I absolutely and utterly uh, condemn and distance myself from in, every, in any way, shape or form, because bottom line, and this is frankly, viewers, why this whole part is so enraging, because anyone who knows me will know that I am against discrimination of any kind, and I am certainly against people being deprived their human rights and people being persecuted on the basis of their religious beliefs. That's just been a constant throughout my life. It's how I felt as a Jehovah's Witness. It's how I feel as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, which is why, as I'm going to show you in this video, I have spoken out against the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses on grounds of their religious beliefs in the case of Russia. So they're, they're quite simply trying to portray me as being someone that I don't recognise. And in this case, they're doing that based on what some random person has said in the live chats to one of my videos. So bear, bear this in mind. Some suit in the legal department has been watching that live stream of us talking about the Shepherd book with the purpose of finding incriminating things that we've said. And rather than jotting down what I've said or what Mark said, they've been looking at the live chat for incriminating things that people are saying in the live chat that they can pin on me. And the way they try and pin it on me is in the footnotes. It says under footnote four, actually, let's, let's read footnote three because that's also quoted. In R.V. Bonehill Payne, Joshua, the Court of Appeal upheld a sentence of three years, four months for hate speech. The defendant had posted statements which encouraged persons to attend an anti jewification if it upsets me just to read this language that's how that's how alien it is to me attend an anti jewification event which he said inter alia would be an absolute gas in obvious reference to the gas chambers used by the nazis again it wasn't something that i said 
you're talking about a random YouTube user who, for all I know, could be a Jehovah's Witness. For all I know, this could have been a comment that was planted there by the organization to make me look bad. I'm not saying it was. I'm, I'm just saying, who is this? What, why is... Why are the words of some random person on the internet being pinned on me? Well, we get to that in the, in the fourth footnote. In R.V. Shepherd and another, the Court of Appeal upheld criminal convictions for hate speech against the owner of an internet website and another for uploading material which minimised the Holocaust and contained racially inflammatory material. In Delphi AS versus Estonia, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights held that the owner of a website is legally responsible for user comments containing hate speech. I think they're trying to say that it was my responsibility to uh, make sure that this person didn't comment or that his, his or her or their comment was immediately removed i'm not the owner of the website i wish i was i wish i did own youtube why am i being held legally responsible with even quoting from lawsuits from goodness knows where and goodness knows when trying to claim that it's my website it's not my website it's a YouTube channel. And how is this random places to visit in North Yorkshire being quoted as though he represents my views in any way, shape or form? This is the level of dishonesty we're dealing with. But fasten your seatbelts because <laughs> we're in for arguably worse examples of CCJW twisting the truth and trying to mislead Ixa. Let's press on with example number three. Recently, Jehovah's people have been persecuted in Russia. But will the persecution succeed in eliminating true worship in that area of the world? No. Why not? It's because Jehovah is with them. He and Jesus promised, I am with you. Russia did not learn from the past. It will prove to be the same for them as it was for Nazi Germany under Hitler. Hitler thought his regime could eradicate true worship and God's people from areas under their control, but they made a big mistake. While it is true, they murdered some 2,000 brothers. In the end, the scheme ended up in failure. Why? Because God was with us, not with them. God with us? Those words have decorated national emblems and even the uniforms of soldiers of Prussia and the Tsarist Russian Empire. These words were also on the belts of German troops when they marched into Belgium in the year 1914 of our common era. But they had it wrong. The sovereign Lord Jehovah was with us, not with them. He's with all of us now. He'll be with us during Armageddon. He'll be with us after Armageddon. He'll be with us at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. He'll be with mankind at the end of hundred thousand years. He'll be with humans at the end of 100 million years and at the end of 100 million years times 100 million years. Jehovah will be with mankind forever, and so will Jesus. They are both on record as saying, I am with you. Quite remarkable little display of, you could say, emotion there by Garrett Loesch, coming up with some big numbers. <laughs> as to how far into eternity Jehovah is going to be with his people. I was interested more than anything in two things, really. First of all, he was talking there about 
got mit uns and the fact that those words adorned the belt buckles of German troops in both World War One and World War Two. Uh, he doesn't really mention the Third Reich there, but those words were also on the um, on the belt buckles of Nazi officers. For me, that whole story, the the fact that then even the Nazis could claim that God was on their side should be a cautionary tale for people like Gerrit Loesch to remind them that just because they say God is on their side doesn't mean that God is on their side. You can do some pretty evil things, we've learned, claiming to have God on your side. Just because you're making that claim doesn't make it so. And yet Gerrit Loesch just says, oh, well, they didn't have God on their side. We do have God on our side. We being an organization that breaks apart families through shunning, persuades people to die rather than accept blood transfusions and covers up child sex abuse on an industrial scale. We're the ones who have God on our side, not the Nazi officers who were carrying out the Holocaust and that sort of thing. It's it's just ridiculous, quite frankly. But also you have this reveling in persecution. I've said before, I, I've called it persecution porn. They seem to love the idea of witnesses getting persecuted. And you have here fighting talk almost from Gerrit Loesch towards Russia, saying, oh, you're making the exact same mistake that Hitler made. You don't know what you're up against. Uh, we will prevail. True worship will prevail in Russia. Gerrit Loesch knows from experience that persecution can stir up people's emotions, can stir up the emotions of Jehovah's Witnesses, and convince them that they are part of God's one and only true organization. Because, of course, God's true organization is supposed to be persecuted. And, oh, wonderful, here's a, here's a country, here's a regime that's persecuting us. There's your evidence. If only totalitarian regimes like Putin's could get it into their heads that what they are doing is helping the organization not hampering it. In the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, they are validating everything that the organization says will happen to their followers. And just as you would expect, not only have the organization enshrined the actions of one country into their understanding of Bible prophecy, so that Russia is now again the king of the north, and all of this was apparently prophesied in the book of Daniel, but they're also repeatedly referring to Russia in video after video after video after video precisely because they know that this plays well for stirring up emotions and for motivating witnesses. Before we move on to the next segment though, I do just also want to fact check Gerrit Loesch because he says at one point that 2,000 uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were murdered under the Nazi regime. Hitler thought his regime could eradicate true worship and God's people from areas under their control, but they made a big mistake. While it is true, they murdered some 2,000 brothers. In the end, the scheme ended up in failure. I don't know what figures Gerrit Loesch is referring to, but I actually researched this quite extensively when I was writing The Reluctant Apostate, using various sources, including the excellent work of Jim Penton, um, his book, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Third Reich. I'm just looking at it in my collection. Uh, that book in particular is a fantastic resource in learning more about what happened to Jehovah's Witnesses over these years. But there weren't 2,000 casualties. It was actually 1,200. So, you know, 1,200 is still a big number, but it's not 2,000. I'm curious to know why Gerrit Loesch is exaggerating that number, um, but it was actually 1,200, and of those 1,200, it was 250 witnesses were outright executed for being witnesses. The rest died in concentration camps in custody through maltreatment. So that's the true number, 1,200. Don't let Gerrit Loesch convince you otherwise. So this is a bit of a complicated one. 
I think what's happening here, well, first of all, the organization doesn't like me calling them out on persecution porn and the fact that the Russian ban on Jehovah's Witnesses, which again, I've repeatedly spoken out against, the fact that that plays into the hands of the organization because it allows them to circle the wagons. In a way, it confirms the narrative of the Jehovah's Witness religion because Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Jehovah's Witnesses get persecuted. Ah, that must mean we're followers of Jesus. So I've said all this before. Everyone seems to understand exactly what my position is, but CCJW are, and we're going to see stronger examples of this, they're purposefully trying or have purposefully tried to misrepresent my condemnation of the Russian ban as being sort of agreeing with it or trying to pin the blame on individual Jehovah's Witnesses. So, for example, they quote the part where I say, they seem to love the idea of witnesses getting persecuted. I'm quite clearly speaking in terms of the leadership and the fact that persecution benefits them because, again, it it gives them a license to make all sorts of propaganda and remind witnesses that they are God's chosen people. I think all of that's straightforward. But the main issue here for CCJW, I think is that they didn't like me fact-checking Garrett Loesch when he said that, quote, some 2,000 Jehovah's Witnesses died at the hands of the Nazis. But it is true, they murdered some 2,000 brothers. In the end, the scheme ended up in failure. Now, just for some context, I want to play you a couple of clips on the importance of accuracy and truthfulness. The first is a clip that was recently shown to Jehovah's Witnesses at their meetings as part of a video warning against apostate sources. Some unauthorized apps may include low quality information that is only partially correct. Remember, if it's just 10% correct, it is 100% misleading. If it's 10% correct, it's 100% misleading. Apparently, the Jehovah's Witness religion is all about accuracy. And it was with this in mind, I'm sure, that David Splain did a JW Broadcasting episode in which he gave the speech, the talk, Producing Accurate Publications. Now, someone might ask, why is it necessary to be so picky to be so fussy about accuracy. And an answer I like to give uh, an, uh, an experience that I heard about a few years ago. In Northern Europe, there was a man who accepted a Bible study from Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, when he was asked uh, what motivated him to want to study, he said, I read an article in your Awake magazine on trees. Now, I happen to be a bit of an expert on trees. And after I read the article, I said to myself, that article was so well documented. It was so precise. Any organization that is that careful when writing about trees is going to be just as careful when teaching me the Bible. And on that basis, he accepted a Bible study. Now, an area where great care needs to be taken is when we're quoting statistics. A newspaper may report on a disaster in a certain country and and say that 10,000 people were killed in the disaster. Immediately, our researchers are going to ask, where did they get that statistic? They might phone the newspaper and ask for the source. And if the reporter can't confirm the statistic, our researchers will go to another source, a more official source, to get the correct statistic. So apparently the faithful slave, the governing body, whatever you want to call them, they're all about accuracy. They're all about getting things right. They're all about not trying to mislead or exaggerate. And specifically when it comes to statistics quoted in their materials, 
They want to get that number right. So it was with this in mind that I corrected Garrett Loesch on his figure of some 2,000 Jehovah's Witnesses being killed during the Nazi regime. And I said, no, no, according to my research, when I was researching for my book, The Reluctant Apostate, it was 1,200. And in the video, I quote from the book, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Third Reich by Jim Penton, who I've interviewed on the channel. He's arguably the foremost Watchtower historian. Watchtower isn't going to quote from him, though, because he's, well, I suppose they'd consider him an apostate, someone who has critical things to say about the organisation. But it was reading this book that really helped me to understand what happened. What happened in Germany up to and during the Second World War when Jehovah's Witnesses were persecuted? Because this is something that I feel passionately about, because even though I'm no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses, if I'd been in that situation as a Jehovah's Witness, I would have been one of these ones who'd been thrown in the concentration camps. I would have refused, I would think, to give up my, my loyalty to the organisation. I would have potentially been killed. So I take this stuff personally. Even though I'm no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean it when I say that it's wrong, it's evil and barbaric to persecute people and kill them based on their faith. And this affects me as someone who used to be a Jehovah's Witness and could very easily have ended up in that situation if I'd been born in the wrong time and place. So Jim Penton's book is where I learned about Rutherford's attempts to placate the Nazi regime specifically in the year 1933 when he wrote the Declaration of Facts which was like a last-ditch attempt to say to the Nazi regime you know we're not so different we're not so different we actually feel the same way as you guys feel about Jews that's what it says in the Declaration of Facts. Hang on. If you don't believe me, Jehovah's Witnesses, this is the book to read, your own book. The 1934 Yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses contains the Declaration of Facts. You can read it for yourself. Rutherford has very, very scathing, hateful things to say about Jews in the Declaration of Facts. And he also has words of admiration for the policies of Hitler's Nazi government. And it was reading Jim Penton's book that made me realise, ah, it wasn't just a case of Jehovah's Witnesses being in the wrong place at the wrong time. What happened was Rutherford failed in, in his attempt to ingratiate his religion to Hitler it all went sour, and as a result of effectively being snubbed by Hitler, Rutherford went on the offensive and put Jehovah's Witnesses on the front line. He made them even more conspicuous than they already were by making them hand out, in Nazi-occupied Germany, documents condemning the Nazis. Is it any wonder that they ended up being targeted and thrown into concentration camps? So it's when you learn about the full context, not that's just to be absolutely clear, that in no way um, condones them being thrown into concentration camps. It's just important to understand they probably wouldn't have been killed and persecuted in anywhere near the numbers that they were killed and persecuted if not for the fact that Rutherford essentially used them as as fodder he he put them in harm's way to carry out his personal vendetta against hitler so that's the context 
which I'm referring to. But on this matter of the figures, Jim Penton, well, first of all, you may have noticed that during the quote, there is a scrolling caption that indicates that in a Watchtower magazine, the August 15th, 2005 Watchtower, it gives a figure of 1,200. So here's the quote. For the vast majority of the witnesses, denying their faith was out of the question. Thus, about 1,200 of them died during the Nazi period. So you have a figure there. In the Faithful Slaves publications of 1,200, you then have Jim Penton, an apostate, citing 1,200. And let's look at the specific quote because it's actually in, I think, Appendix 5. It's Appendix I, an analysis of the numbers of Jehovah's Witnesses imprisoned and killed in Nazi Germany. He devotes an entire appendix to this one subject of how many Jehovah's Witnesses were either imprisoned or killed in Nazi Germany. And here's what he says in that appendix. How many were killed or died from cold, hunger, overwork, physical punishment and lack of medical treatment? Again, the number must remain indeterminate, but it was certainly lower than 2,000. In all probability, the figure of 1,200 given by Garber and the German governmental Informationen zur politischen Bildung, as cited in note 5 above, is much closer to the truth. So, Penton there references Garber. He's referring to Dr. Detlef Garber, who is cited several times in Watchtower publications as an authority. He is a historian who actually went to the trouble of conducting an in-depth study of concentration camp records for Zwischen Widerstand und Materium. He collated all of the records. Imagine Imagine how much work that would have involved, going through the concentration camp records to find out how many of this religious minority were killed. And as a result of that, not just killed but imprisoned, as a result of that, he found, he found out that the number of Jehovah's Witnesses who died in concentration camps, whether through being executed or simply due to being neglected or dying from cold and hunger, the total number of Jehovah's Witnesses who died in concentration camps, according to an independent historian quoted in Watchtower literature, was 1,200. So you can imagine how I felt watching the JW broadcasting episode and seeing Garrett Loesch say, But it is true, they murdered some 2,000 brothers. In the end, the scheme ended up in failure. Let's recap, shall we? The Watchtower says 1,200. A respected historian quoted in Watchtower literature, Detlef Garber, says 1,200. Jim Penton writes uh, endorsing the same number. Garrett Loesch knows better. He's saying it's 2,000. And as I said in the video... Why the need to exaggerate? Now, CCJW, in their document, in their dossier, have a footnote on this. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum states that Jehovah's Witnesses were subjected to intense persecution under the Nazi regime for the exercise of their faith. By 1939, an estimated 6,000 Jehovah's Witnesses were detained in prisons or camps. An estimated 1,000 German Jehovah's Witnesses died in concentration camps and prisons during the Nazi era, as did 400 Witnesses from other countries. In addition, 
about 250 German Jehovah's Witnesses were executed, mostly after being tried and convicted by military tribunals for refusing to serve in the German military. These are minimum estimates. They're not, as I'm going to come to. And then it gives a link. And when you click on the link, it takes you to this page of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I will just say this. The article could have been written by an independent, neutral third party. It says at the bottom of the article that the authors are the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Washington, D.C. I will just say, though, it has the tone of having been written by a Jehovah's Witness or perhaps being authored by the organisation so that the Holocaust Museum can put it on their website. I'm just putting that out there. That's what it seems like to me. But they're quoting here from this final paragraph, which gives a series of numbers. You have there the number 1,000. 1,000 German witnesses died or were murdered in concentration camps and prisons during the Nazi era. You then have the number 400, as did 400 witnesses from other countries. OK, that takes us to 1,400. And then further down, in addition, at least 273 Jehovah's Witnesses were sentenced to death by military courts for, for refusing military service. So 1,000 plus 400 plus 273 is 1,673. That's still not 2,000. And they, they seem to know this when they're quoting from this web page, which, by the way, does not give any references as to where these figures have come from, I personally trust a respected historian who's gone to the trouble of going through all of the records for all of the concentration camps. But anyway, let's take this 1,673 figure. Again, still not 2,000. Watchtower seemingly aware of this, say at the end of their footnote, these are minimum estimates. Look at the quote that they're basing all of this on in their defence of Gerrit Loesch. Only the figure of 273 says at least. Only that figure is a minimum estimate. None of the other figures, the 1,000 figure and the 400 figure, have any indication of being minimum estimates. So again, my question is, why exaggerate? If you have a figure, let's say you have this figure of 1,673, quote that figure, if you believe in that figure. I personally would take the 1,200 as being definitive. But okay, if you want to stand by this figure, and we don't know where it's come from, it's just being cited by an unknown writer for the Holocaust Museum, quote that figure. What is achieved by exaggerating the victims of a tragedy? Let's say there was a school shooting, and let's say 17 students were killed in this school shooting, would the newspaper say 20 students were killed? No. The newspaper would say 17 students were killed. They wouldn't say some 20 students were killed. They would say 17. Because there's no need to exaggerate. There's no need to round up. What happens when you exaggerate is that you cheapen the tragedy you become less credible. And by becoming less credible, any words of empathy or any words of outrage or horror become less credible because people are thinking, well, why are you exaggerating? It's bad enough. It's bad enough that 1,200... It would be bad enough if one person 
if one Jehovah's Witness died in Nazi Germany purely because of their religion, that would be bad enough. So it's a tragedy, it's a catastrophe that 1,200 died. But even if you want to take this unverified figure of 1,673, why round it up? Why round it up to 2,000? That was my honest question. But simply by asking that question, I am being framed as a Holocaust denier. By my former religion. They are in effect saying that I'm in cahoots with those who would who would deny that the whole thing happened. And it's infuriating viewers. Maybe you can tell in my demeanour. But um hold me accountable based on what I say. You know? Don't misquote me. Don't drag the words of someone who no one knows, some random person commenting in the live chat, and pretend that that's what I've said. I'll stand by what I've said. I'll stand by my own words all day long. Um, there's no need to misquote them. And what does it say about the organisation if they have to misquote them in order to achieve their objective. Anyway, let's move on, because there's more examples of me apparently inciting relig religious hatred against Jehovah's Witnesses. Here follows a video from 2018. In 1939, neighbouring Germany started World War II. Because the Nazis were set on exterminating Jehovah's Witnesses, many of them had to flee the country. Moved by unselfish love, Hermann opened his home to offer them shelter. On May 10, 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. Now, Hermann and his family were also at risk of falling prey to the Nazi regime. Obviously, it's tragic the way witnesses were treated back during the time of the Third Reich. Certainly no a uh, group of people deserves to be persecuted and even killed based purely on their religious beliefs, just purely, just based purely on the ideas that they have in their heads. What's interesting is that Hitler's obsession with Jehovah's Witnesses, it could be argued that in to a, a large extent it was fueled by the actions of Watchtower's president, Joseph Rutherford. And if you are a witness watching this and you think, what on earth are you talking about? Uh, look up the history, uh, do some research on Joseph Rutherford and Hitler, because you will find that before the war in the 1930s, Rutherford was making overtures <laughs> towards the Nazi regime to try and ingratiate his movement with the Nazis. It sounds shocking, but it's true. And in fact, if I go to my bookshelf, um, this is a very damning publication, if you can hunt it down, the 1934 Yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses has in it Rutherford's Declaration of Facts. The Declaration of Facts is basically Rutherford's tirade against the Nazis after his efforts at ingratiating himself and the movement with the Nazis have failed. And it has some astonishing material. I've actually done a video on this. It has some astonishing material about the Jews in this particular book, uh, indicating that Rutherford was actually anti-Semitic. But my point is that the tragedy, or at least part of the tragedy of what happened to Jehovah's Witnesses in Central Europe during the Second World War at the hands of the Nazis could potentially have been avoided if it wasn't for this botched attempt by Rutherford at, um, at ingratiating himself with Hitler and Rutherford's subsequent campaign of putting Jehovah's Witnesses front centre in his personal vendetta with Hitler. So in other words, 
rather than telling witnesses to hunker down and sit it out and, you know, don't worry, this will hopefully pass, but maintain your faith between yourselves, he urged them to distribute material criticising Hitler and criticising the Nazis in German-occupied Europe, in Germany and, and what have you, which was obviously only going to have one outcome. In recent years, Jehovah's people in Russia have experienced intense persecution. So let's just do a brief little journey on JW.org. We're going to press or click Newsroom. We're going to click Legal Developments. And here's some recent news over the past year from Russia. Last May, Dennis Christensen was jailed for organizing activity of a religious organization declared extremist. July, the Supreme Court of, Russia, of the Russian Federation upheld a claim to liquidate the Administrative Center of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia and 395 local religious organizations used by Jehovah's Witnesses throughout Russia. December, the appellate court upheld an earlier ruling declaring the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures in Russian banned and added this to the federal list of extremist materials. So it is illegal to possess our Bible in Russian in that land. Just a few weeks ago, the appellate court upheld an earlier court ruling that the administrative center of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia can be confiscated and turned into state property. So those of you who follow my channel will know exactly what I think about what's happening in Russia at the moment. Putin's regime in Russia has taken this heavy-handed extreme measure of banning Jehovah's Witnesses and we can see what the effect is in this talk. I've already talked extensively about the persecution complex that Jehovah's Witnesses have. Bottom line, Jehovah's Witnesses, whether they will admit it or not, they love to be persecuted. And this is one of the many reasons why I've argued against what is happening in Russia. Because apart from anything else, apart from the human rights aspect, apart from the fact that it's just nice to be able to offer some solidarity and common ground and dispel the myth of angry apostates who are bent on the destruction and annihilation of Jehovah's people, Apart from anything else, this is what the governing body wants. They want to be able to jump up and down and say, look, we're being persecuted in Russia. Doesn't this just prove that we're God's one and only chosen people? Doesn't this just prove that Satan's out to get us? So we all need to huddle together and be this persecuted, oppressed people. And what's even more fascinating is that in addition to having this as part of the talk itself, the next video that we're going to watch also references what's happening in Russia. So where to even begin? Um, well, again, it's just a blatant misquote, isn't it? They don't like me drawing attention to the truth about Jehovah's Witnesses in Nazi Germany and the build-up to World War II and the involvement that Rutherford had due to his botched attempt at ingratiating the organisation to the Nazis. And I do just want to make one correction uh, to what I was saying back in 2018. I was watching it thinking, that's wrong. But it's nothing to do with hate speech. I said in the video, the Declaration of Facts is basically Rutherford's tirade against the Nazis after his efforts at ingratiating himself and the movement with the Nazis have failed. That's not true. I was watching that thinking, what are you saying? Um, no, the Declaration of Facts wasn't a tirade against the Nazis. It was a plea to the Nazis to uh, ease up on the persecution because, again, the arguments being put forward in the Declaration of Facts amounted to, we're not so different. We feel the same way about the Jews. Um, we admire your, your style of 
politics or I forget what the exact words were. It, it definitely wasn't a tirade against the Nazis. If anything, it was a, la a last ditch attempt to again ingratiate the movement to the Nazis. So I just want to clarify that for posterity. Everything else I more or less stand by. Obviously, you have the part about the Nazis and then we jump to later on in the rebuttal where I'm talking about what's happening in Russia, you will have noticed that they miss out where I condemn the Russian ban and refer to it as heavy-handed and extreme. Putin's regime in Russia has taken this heavy-handed, extreme measure of banning Jehovah's Witnesses, just as I'd referred to the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in, in Nazi Germany as a tragedy. Obviously, it's tragic the way witnesses were treated back during the time of the Third Reich. I'm literally speaking against these things, but they skip past the parts where I clarify my position and they isolate anything that could sort of be construed as being sympathetic to the persecution or in some way dismissive of it. And in the case of Russia, they single out seven seconds of me saying, bottom line, Jehovah's Witnesses, whether they will admit it or not, they love to be persecuted. Taken in isolation, that may sound odd, but when you apply the context, later on, just a couple of sentences later, I say, this is what the governing body wants. Apart from anything else, this is what the governing body wants. They want to be able to jump up and down and say, look, we're being persecuted in Russia. So I clarify, and this is the problem I have. I do try as much as possible to differentiate between individual Jehovah's Witnesses and the governing body. But as careful as I am, inevitably there are going to be times when I refer to the governing body and the religion interchangeably. And that's what I've done here. Um, I don't think that individual Jehovah's Witnesses crave persecution. Um, they certainly need it to bolster their beliefs, but that doesn't mean that they crave it. When it comes to the governing body, however, certainly the way they respond to any reports of persecution and the way they exploit the stories indicates that they're, ex well, they are exploiting it and they are benefited greatly by examples of oppression of the religion. That view has nothing at all to say about inciting religious hatred against Jehovah's Witnesses, which is the title of this document. How am I inciting religious hatred of Jehovah's Witnesses by pointing out that persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses is wrong because it serves the agenda of the leadership, which is basically what I'm saying here. By the way, I should just mention that in this quote, in this example that we're dealing with, there's another footnote which I should include because it's horrendous. Um, they're really keen on this R.V. Shepherd case. In R.V. Shepherd and another, the defendant was convicted and imprisoned for inter alia publication of a book which, quote, cast doubt on the existence of the Holocaust, close quote, and, quote, suggested that the Jewish people had a history of inventing stories of the commission of atrocities against them, end of quote. Mr. Evans's hate-filled statements are at least as serious alleging that Jehovah's Witnesses are to a large extent responsible for the barbaric acts committed on them by the Nazis. I can't tell you how enraging it is to have that said about me, even though whenever I'm talking about the treatment of Jehovah's Witnesses in the Third Reich, 
I'm being very clear to condemn it. And I'm certainly not claiming it didn't happen. Um, but I'm being honest about the circumstances surrounding this persecution and the fact that while there is no excuse for the way the Nazis treated Jehovah's Witnesses, it almost certainly would not have been as severe if not for the um, the role of Rutherford and his botched attempt at ingratiating the Nazis. And I actually quote from Jim Penton along these lines in my book, The Reluctant Apostate. Jim Penton says the same thing. It is true that the witnesses would have suffered some severe persecution for maintaining their principles and especially for refusing to heil Hitler and to perform military service after Germany introduced universal male conscription in 1935. That said, had they not confronted the Nazis directly, they would have fared much better. But Rutherford seemed not to care about the safety of the witnesses in Germany any more than he cared about the safety of his brethren in the United States and other lands. That is simply the argument that I am repeating in my videos. The view of a respected historian, Jim Penton, in saying, yes, it would have happened anyway, to at least some extent, because we're talking about an entire demographic of people who wouldn't have said Heil Hitler. That's going to get them in trouble in Nazi Germany by itself. But would would the Nazis have gone after them with, with quite the enthusiasm, if not for the fact that Rutherford had basically put them in harm's way by making them the ones who would carry out his personal vendetta due to having been snubbed following the Declaration of Facts. I just wanted to include that for completeness. Now we move on to the next example of me inciting hatred, and it's from a video in 2019. I love the recent video in, it's been posted on their website of Irina and Dennis Christensen. And what a beautiful video. And every time I see that Brother Christensen smile, it makes me realize that the King of the North in no way has defeated that brother. I mean, in fact, I think when I see his beautiful smile, I think of Acts 6.15, when Stephen, just before he was stoned, the Bible said he had the face of an angel, just calm, serene in the face of that intimidating situation. You, you see the same thing on Brother Christensen, uh, do we not? In fact, just recently, in a handwritten copy, Brother Christensen wrote to the governing body. And I want to read you some of what he wrote to the governing body. And he had to do it longhand because, of course, they don't give him a computer or typewriter. But uh, here's what he wrote to the governing body from Dennis Christensen, detention prison, Oriol, Russia, May 5th. So just a couple of weeks ago. Dear brothers, I would like to thank you all for the great work you've done for me, especially in the last two years of my life. From the beginning of my arrest and time in prison, I knew that my assignment was to keep myself strong physically, emotionally, and spiritually here inside the prison walls. And I have never doubted that you would do all you could do for me outside the prison walls. I want you to know that I really love and respect you all. Although we have never met personally, I feel I know you all very well. Maybe because of the broadcasting. Dear brothers, it's so nice to see you there, your smiles, your feelings, and the love you have for Jehovah and the truth. I miss the broadcastings and to see your happy faces and living faith. So you don't let him watch it there in prison. I often pray to Jehovah about you, the governing body, because I know there is great pressure on your shoulders. For me, it's a great honor to be a little instrument in the hand of Jehovah and His Son, Jesus Christ, an instrument that they could use to preach about the kingdom and to encourage our dear brothers and sisters. 
But I also want to say that it's a great honor for me to serve under your guidance and advice. I hope one day in the future to meet you all face to face and thank you. But maybe it will not be possible because the time is running fast and the end of this system is getting closer and closer. I know that we have different assignments and I am looking forward to the day when you will take your place side by side with Jesus Christ in God's kingdom. And I will be happy to serve under your guidance then too. Dear brothers, please be assured of the fact that I am very grateful for you, for all of your advice, all of your hard work, all of your prayers and love for me and my family with Christian love, your brother, Dennis Christensen. If I were Stephen Lett, I would be praying that Dennis Christensen never wakes up. And which, let's face it, if you don't have access to, or you have limited access to Watchtower propaganda for a sustained period, and you just have your own thoughts to kind of cycle through, it's not impossible that he might figure it out, even without, I don't know, JW facts. I don't know whether he'd be able to get JW facts. But it's not inconceivable that someone who is cut off from that constant flow of propaganda and indoctrination could figure it out and realize, oh, hold on, um, I'm being exploited here. And make no mistake, that's exactly the word that describes how they're using this guy who's, you know, rotting in a Russian prison cell purely because he got roped into the wrong cult. And again, I strongly condemn what Russia is doing. I don't think there's any justification for treating people who are already victims of a cult in this way. But it has to be acknowledged that there's at least a chance that on his own, left to his own devices, Dennis Christian could wake up. And if that were to happen, if it were to happen, <laughs> this material, this footage of Stephen Lett reading Dennis Christensen's letter would not age well. And that's an area that I think that Watchtower has been fairly naive in, in just assuming that all of the people who feature in their propaganda material will stay as Jehovah's Witnesses all the way through to the end of their lives. It's just not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination. And the more they promote one individual the more they put themselves at risk of it backfiring. So I'm just putting it out there. I'm not saying that Dennis Christensen will wake up. I'm just saying if he were to, he would be well within his rights to feel very used and very exploited. He even uses the word instrument. I'm being used as an instrument. Well, all Jehovah's Witnesses, including those in the audience clapping along like seals, to this clear example of exploitation and jumping on uh, scary or tragic events, they're all being used as instruments of Watchtower. They just don't know it. What an outstanding video and what a beautiful, motivating song that uh, went along with that video. But brothers and sisters, may all of us be determined to apply the lessons of this wonderful convention that Jehovah has given us. May we apply these lessons fully determined that love will never fail. Now we know Jehovah will never fail. His love will never fail. Well, may we be determined to imitate him in letting our love never ever fail all to Jehovah's glory. And thus ends the 2019 Love Never Fails Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, I say thus ends. We still have one more video in the rebuttal series where again I'll be going through the drama, the story of Josiah. I really do consider that to be 
the most disturbing material that's shown to witnesses at this convention for reasons I'm going to go into. But yeah, I mean, it was basically a, a cookie cutter paint by numbers ending to a convention. Remind witnesses that they are a persecuted minority, make them fearful, remind them of the, the bogeyman under the bed. Remind them of the need to persevere, to endure, to stay loyal, play to their emotions, try to distract them from thinking critically, from thinking logically, um, sell the positives, ignore all the negatives, make them feel as though this is the only place where they can feel loved and accepted and appreciated. And we saw all of those things in Stephen Let's Talk with a little bit of craziness, or well not a little bit, a lot of craziness and delusion thrown in. But those were my thoughts for the Sunday of the 2019 Love Never Fails Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. So yes, more of the same, I'm afraid. Some simply outrageous misquoting going on there. And before I really launch into this, I want to revisit that JW Broadcasting episode by David Splain producing accurate publications where he talks about the need to quote in context. Now, suppose that a writer wants to quote something from a book. In the reference material, he'll supply a photocopy of the quote in the book but very often he'll give us two or three pages before the quote and two or three pages after as well. And that way, our researchers can examine the quote in context to make sure that uh, what we're saying in print is really what the author of the quote had in mind. For example, an evolutionist might make a statement which, on the surface, appears to confirm his support of creation. Or perhaps an atheist will make a statement that seems to indicate that he believes in God. But when you examine the quote in context, you realize that that isn't what the author had in mind at all. We would never deliberately distort a quotation. We try very hard to use all of our quotations in context. Well, the evidence suggests otherwise, David Splain, at least when it comes to your legal department, and the depths they will stoop to, to frame me as being a Holocaust denier or a hateful person, just so that you can get a free run, just so Jehovah's Witnesses can appear before Ixa with no one to give the other side of the argument when it comes to issues surrounding child protection. How do you describe what's just happened with these quotes about Russia in any other way than to call it a gross misquote. They literally stop quoting from me when, in the same breath, I'm about to say, again, I strongly condemn what Russia is doing. Who's, you know, rotting in a Russian prison cell purely because he got roped into the wrong cult. And again, I strongly condemn what Russia is doing. I don't think there's any justification for treating people who are already victims of a cult in this way. The same breath. I hadn't even drawn breath. I was in such a hurry to get that significant caveat in precisely for the reason that I didn't want anyone to get confused and I didn't want Jehovah's Witnesses to have any legitimate grounds to think that just because I was speculating on Dennis Christensen's situation and the possibility of him one day waking up and realising that he was being exploited, I was desperate to make sure that they understood fully. Anyone watching my video could understand how I feel about the Russian ban and about the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses. And as if it's in any doubt at all, Allow me to play you a montage of clips, including me appearing on BBC World Service Radio condemning the ban and giving 
a message to Jehovah's Witnesses in Russian condemning the ban. Try to remember, if, if you are an ex-witness who is upset about this, try to remember what it was like for you when you were a believing Jehovah's Witness. And imagine what it would feel like to get thrown into a jail cell just for being caught with literature or to be in some way penalised or treated like a criminal just for going to a meeting or just for observing your religion in some way. Imagine you being in that situation. Imagine if you have still believing witness relatives, imagine them being thrown in jail cells. Do you really, really want that? Do you really want the, the people who are already cult victims to be treated like fugitives? Rukovidyashi Soviet Polnistu Uveren. It Jorda Ubijon, Sto Yogova Budit i Dalsha Zabotica Avas Vavsiek Atnashenyach. Ivod Kak on Zakonchil Ya Prosta Hatchus Kazatvan, Sto Rukovadyashie Savieta i Vashes Vidyetel Yegove. Ni jeden stwinie, kto czustwojet, sypia plocha i za prajs ha dżaszewa. Mnogi je bływsie swiedzietielia i jakowoj. Takija kakja mnoga wiejat w prawa cielawieke. Mnogi je iz nas stali, że dwanie, że stoki polityki i zbieganie organizacje. I nasi siemie bolsie ni gwarat z nami je prosta patamu. Što moj bolsie ni saglašajam się Sledovat za sanjesanom i jevo družjamje. Pa etamo moj sliškem harašo znajem, kak eta čustvojet narušenje vaše religioznih svabod. I moj nje želajem etava nikamu, vkučaje vas. Moj stajim s vami i nadim se, što voj praj dojtje, um, let's talk now to Lloyd Evans, a former Jehovah Witness, author of The Reluctant Apostate. You're very welcome to the programme, Lloyd. Well, let me start with the idea of uh, banning the group in Russia as the Russian government wants to do. What's your um, thoughts on it? Uh, hello, Nula. I think it's a terrible idea. Um, there are three main reasons why I'm opposed to the ban on Jehovah's Witnesses. First reason is human rights, fairly obviously. Everyone should be free to believe uh, according to their conscience. And for the state to say to a group of people, you're not allowed to pursue this particular religious denomination um, is a very scary step towards something that Orwellian would have, uh, that Orwell would have dreamed of. Uh, the second reason is persecution complex. I think that um, with Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of the uh, teachings and beliefs are oriented around uh, the, the Satan's world coming after them. And this sort of action by the Russian authorities really kind of bolsters that kind of fear and paranoia. And the third reason is that, you know, by banning Jehovah's Witnesses, you're driving the organization underground. And that makes a lot of the more uh, darker, more abusive practices harder to regulate. A spokesperson for the Jehovah's Witnesses said Tuesday that investigators in the Siberian city of Sergut had stripped, suffocated, doused with water and applied stun guns on at least seven believers detained on extremism charges, days after criminal cases were reportedly initiated against 19 Jehovah's Witnesses following mass raids. So I realise I've spoken about this a number of times, but I, it's just one of those times in your life where you think, no, something needs to be said about this. Um, I, I do not want to be, I don't want anyone who watches my channel or who stumbles on my channel who might be a Jehovah's Witness just assuming that I'm okay with this just because I'm an ex-witness. Um, I want to make it very clear that I utterly, utterly... Um, condemn this torture in the strongest possible terms and if it were in my power to prevent it if i were there at the time i'd be doing everything i can to stop it um we need to be better than this we need to find ways of tackling cults and tackling destructive mind control groups that do not involve involve punishing the victims i'm not sure how i could have been any more clear on my YouTube channel, 
in front of thousands of viewers and subscribers that I condemn the actions of the Russian government in singling out my former religion for persecution. I couldn't have been clearer about my position and the reasons for my position. And in fact, for having this position, for giving this opinion on my YouTube channel, I recall receiving a barrage of abuse at the time from fellow ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. I summarise it in my video, The Day After the Ban. I briefly talk about the fact that I've had no end of um, abuse and vitriol thrown at me from other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses for speaking out against the actions of Putin. I got serious flack for taking that stand. And yet when you read this vile document, you would think that I'm in favour of it. You would think that I'm, oh yeah, brilliant. Jehovah's Witnesses are being persecuted in Russia. They've brought this upon themselves. They just love it. That's the, the message you'd potentially come away with. In fact, that's exactly how they characterize all of this. In the footnote, there's a footnote for this section, for this example that they're giving. Again, they cite R versus Shepherd. As in R versus Shepherd and another, where the defendants were criminally convicted of alleging that Jewish people exaggerated or invented stories of atrocities against them, this is a clear example of hate speech in which Mr. Evans accuses Jehovah's Witnesses of exaggerating and even wanting the persecution inflicted on them by the Russian Federation, referring to it as the bogeyman under the bed, and that Jehovah's Witnesses crave persecution to such an extent that it is for them persecution porn. See section 3 below for examples of this hate-filled speech. That's how they're characterising this. They're seriously suggesting that I'm a cheerleader for the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses and that I'm suggesting that individual Jehovah's Witnesses want to be persecuted when if you watch what I have to say in context... It's clear that that's not what I mean. But they don't want Ixa, or they were relying on Ixa not reading this in context, because they're being dishonest. Because they were trying to cheat the system and rig the inquiry in their favour by getting rid of a critic so that they wouldn't have to worry about me drawing Ixa's attention to the way they're putting children at risk. Let's just frame him as being this hate-filled person who craves seeing Jehovah's Witnesses persecuted, even though we know that that's not who he is. Even though we have actually been watching these videos and seen him bending over backwards to say that he condemns what's happening in Russia. They still have the goal, having sat through footage of me saying that it's wrong for Jehovah's Witnesses to be persecuted, they still have the gall to write this in the footnote. That's the level of dishonesty we're dealing with, unfortunately. And there's more to come, because there's another video I want to share with you that was apparently of great interest to the legal department, and it's a video from 2018. In many cases, it was not the youth that wanted to go to college but the parents pushed them toward that. For some, it is kind of an old age insurance that when they get older or get into financial problems, then the rich children would be able to care for them, the older parents as well, they think, they hope. But if parents in their 40s now think of financial security for themselves through their children, once they, the parents, are older, like in their 60s or 70s, where is the attitude of living with the urgency of the time in mind? 
Where's the faith? So Garrett has just told, again, I don't know how many young people, we're talking potentially, I don't know, hundreds of, of young people in his audience, potentially thousands, because this is, after all, a branch visit intended for the country of Canada. So there's no telling how many young people he's addressing at this point. He is telling Canadian young, young Canadian Jehovah's Witnesses that their parent, if their parent wants them to go to college or university, there's probably an ulterior motive. Probably the parent is thinking, I want a nest egg for when I'm older. I'm going to give my child better earning potential so that they can look after me when I'm older. That apparently is the motive that parents have. I, I'm not exaggerating. That's what he's just said. And he can, he, you can argue, oh, well, he said some parents. I'm sorry. I think we all know what we just heard and, and the tone with which it was given. Um, young people are, being, are here being encouraged to distrust their parents' motives if their parents are urging them to go to college or university. And speaking as a parent, my child is nowhere near the age of going to college or university. I will have no interest in her caring for me when I'm older. I'll just want her to be able to look after herself. I honestly, it's the furthest thing from my mind is, oh, well, when I'm really old, this will, I will benefit from this. It could, doesn't even feature um, in, in the mental process there. It's purely a case of, I want what's best for my child. But this, these are the depths to which the governing body will sink in their efforts to force home their agenda of creating this, this dumbed down, subservient base of followers who aren't able to think for themselves, who are entirely dependent on them for their decision making. So <laughs> before I get too wound up thinking about it, let's play the next clip. So let me read to you the footnotes, because this has a footnote as well. This is a gross, hate-filled attack on the nearly 9 million Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide, accusing them of being dumb, subservient, and unable to think for themselves. The Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights has concluded that such expressions are unacceptable, particularly when directed to persons in their private capacity or which target an entire group. I ask you, viewers, was I calling Jehovah's Witnesses dumb, subservient, unable to think for themselves, or was I saying that in trying to deprive young people of higher education to the point of trying to make them suspicious of their parents' motives in encouraging them to go through college and university, the agenda is to create a dumbed-down, subservient base of followers who aren't able to think for themselves. It should be self-evident, or it is self-evident, exactly what I'm saying, when you have the context, which is Garrett Loesch um, saying dreadful things about parents in his efforts to uh, dissuade higher education. It's all obvious with the context, but the context doesn't serve Watchtower's agenda. They need me to be a hate speech enthusiast who has nothing but terrible things to say about individual Jehovah's Witnesses. Not the leadership, individual Jehovah's Witnesses. So they pluck this quote. How many seconds is it? 25 seconds. They've gone through an entire video on Garrett Loesch to pluck out 25 seconds, which in isolation, again, sounds a bit peculiar, but when you listen to the context, it's all completely clear and not remotely hate speech. We move on to the penultimate example of this section, 
and it's from a 2015 video. Fundamentally, sometimes we'll look around and it's nice to have a lot of the Warwick workers here. Uh, I was over there yesterday checking on the progress and it's always very invigorating and you still have to accept the fact, and so do I, is the end going to come before we finish it? And as fast as the brothers and sisters are moving, we can't say and assert that. And recently, we'll be studying it in the months ahead. You have to understand, with Bible prophecy, uh, we've long expected that the end is going to come, the cry of peace and security, and it's on the broadcast. Brother Loesch covered that nicely. We're not coming to a point in this system where anarchy is global. Not before the Great Tribulation, no. So, hence the need to intensify our efforts. We just don't know. Uh, I would like to get in to the room I bid on. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what heaven's doing with the room bids, but uh, I don't think there's a bid up there myself, personally. It's like, you're going over here. Yes, sir. <laughs> Glad I made it. <laughs> so now Tony's indulging in a slight stand-up routine where he's joking about whether he'll get a chance to get into the room he's bid on um, at Warwick before Armageddon comes and he is transferred to heaven where he won't be able to bid on a room because he'll just be directed where to go and what to do and it's just you know everyone's laughing everyone's in hysterics but um i just don't get the point of any of this i don't get the point i mean even when warwick was being designed and discussed before before they even started building it um, Guy Pearce, the late Guy Pearce, said that they weren't sure of Jehovah's direction on whether to go ahead with Warwick or not, but they were going ahead with it anyway. And he made the point that, um, you know, maybe, maybe Armageddon will come while they're building it. Uh, if it does, then great. And yeah, in a way, what difference does it make if this, you know, fictitious event that you're telling us about does come while you're building it. Why Why the urgency in building it before Armageddon comes? If Armageddon's going to come, then surely it makes no difference whether you get into your room or not, what happens. It's all complete silliness and nonsense and verbal flatulence, but apparently the audience love every word of it. So I just want to convey that in recent times to just get the message across it's urgent and have that feeling for him. Don't be running around. I mean, we all need a break. You got to have some time. Look around and don't be caught off guard. If all of a sudden the events bring in the cry of peace and security, and then they think that these last ditch efforts, they're going to be okay. No, we got to help the inactive now to get ready, get back here in the full, and get ready for the Great Tribulation. So Tony wants to remind us that things are urgent, that um, all we need to do is look around us and we can see how urgent you know, things are and how important it is that we all you know, become Jehovah's Witnesses or come back to Jehovah's Witnesses. And you know, watching this bit uh, of, the, of the video, I can't help but remember what, what it was like for me sitting in the audience when I was listening to just this kind of talk you know, year after year after year, uh, being told, you know, really, no, 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 really. <laughs> I know we said it was urgent last year, but believe me, it's really urgent this year. And every year is basically repeating that message. And yet there is no cry wolf phenomenon. There is no witnesses, you know, en masse saying, yes, you told us that last year and the year before that and the year before that. And in fact, for every year that I've been a witness, I've been told it's really coming now. Nobody, you know, seems to put two and two together. And I think it's um, a really, a really troubling aspect of cult mind control that it's able to completely bypass this normal uh, human tendency to be skeptical and to say, well, hang on, you did tell us that last year. You did tell us that the year before. 
I tell you, joy... How does that have anything at all to do with either Holocaust denial or, what was it, inciting religious hatred or vehement and sweeping statements against a religious group? It was a genuine and reasonable observation that Jehovah's Witnesses, due to the mind control that they are under, they aren't able to put two and two together and realize that they're being told the same thing year after year after year after year. It's no slight on them. The criticism was against the leadership for exerting this influence and manipulation over the followers. And this is one of many examples in this dossier where they conflate criticism of rank-and-file Jehovah's Witnesses with criticism of the leaders. Again, I'm struggling to see a single example of any form of hate speech. But we must now take a look at the final example in today's video, and it's based on a convention rebuttal from 2017. Well, personally for me, raising my children is very difficult because my husband is not a witness. With my oldest son, I had a problem when he started dating a girl. Oh dear, a Jehovah's Witness boy starts dating a non-Jehovah's Witness girl. If by any chance you're watching this and you know little about JW beliefs, it's probably at this point that I should tell you that witnesses are only allowed to marry and hence date, from among fellow believers. But don't worry, this boy's mother is not happy about the situation, and she's on the case. When I found out, I was very irritated with him, because I had told him well, and we always talked, and now, suddenly, he's acting differently. For me, James 1, 19 helped me a lot, because there, it mentions that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So I realized that I should have listened to my son first and calmed myself down. Fantastic! The mother has calmed herself down from her understandable rage at learning that her son was having a relationship with someone who doesn't share her religious beliefs. Instead, she is taking the reasonable approach of making him watch a JW Broadcasting dramatization about leading double lives, in which witness youths have their sexual repression reinforced by being reminded to never, ever cultivate romantic attachments with non-witnesses, lest they are disfellowshipped and shunned. I do love a happy ending. And not gotten upset like I did. It's good to apologize when we make mistakes as parents because it will help our children in return to realize the mistakes they are making. We are closer and we feel more comfortable talking to each other about things. Of course, one very fitting apology that nearly all JW parents could offer their children would be to say sorry for insisting that they spend the rest of their lives following a cult just because this makes them feel better about similarly wasting years or even decades of their own lives. And that's the last example in part one of the dossier. We are already three pages in to the nine-page dossier, and this apparently was supposed to be slam-dunk evidence of me being a hate speech enthusiast of me making sweeping and vehement statements against Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm merely offering the observation that if she's going to start talking about parents being open with their children and offering apologies whenever mistakes are made, well, one mistake that she's making, which she's obviously not going to apologise for because she doesn't realise it's a mistake, obviously, is that she is insisting that this lad get roped into the same movement, the same cult that she's involved in, and look at what effect it was having. This is all about sexual repression. This is all about making sure that Jehovah's Witnesses only 
marry other Jehovah's Witnesses or get into any kind of romantic relationship with other Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's what was causing all of the problems between this mother and her son. But apparently it was wrong and it was hate speech for me to be commenting on all this from the perspective of a former Jehovah's Witness. So that's part one. That's part one of the dossier. In part two, we'll be looking at other examples of sweeping and vehement attacks on Jehovah's Witnesses. There's a part A, attacks against the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, and a part B, attacks against all Jehovah's Witnesses, including parents. Spoiler alert, <laughs> they will again conflate my criticism of the governing body and the leadership of the religion with followers of the religion. Because they're dishonest, because they have no shame, because even though they tell their rank and file that they are all about accuracy, that if something's only 10% correct, it's 100% misleading, that they are scrupulous when it comes to getting to the bottom of things, citing accurate statistics, making sure quotes are quoted in context, at least when it comes to the strategies, the trickery of their legal department, all of those principles go out the window if they existed at all to begin with. And it's an ends justifies means fair game approach when it comes to silencing critics. But that's all I've got for you in this particular video. Please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you.